I don't know about you, oh my god, I just, that was a Taylor Swift pun, that was so accidental, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 22, no, I don't know about you, but I love Midnight's by Taylor Swift, I, it was a slow grower, when I first heard it, I was like, it's good, as all Taylor music is good, don't know if it's one of her best, no, it is now February 15th, as of the day I'm filming this, the album came out, I think, on like the 21st of October. Have I listened to anything other than Midnight by Taylor Swift in that time? Yeah, I've listened to Fletcher's Girl of My Dreams, but those two, they're the only two albums I've listened to for the last five months. I'm driving my girlfriend mental because I cannot listen to anything else. And actually, I think Midnight is my second favourite Taylor album ever, which is a big, big thing to say, I know, but it's true. I am who I am. Like, no matter what Taylor does, I love it. I am a millennial white woman, after all. Of course, I love anything Taylor does. But her pop stuff is just undeniably just her best. Like, pop Taylor Swift is an icon. 1989 is my favourite album of all time. Midnight's that syntho pop vibe. Oh, kill me. I love it. But I think one of the other reasons why I love Midnight so much is this undeniable queer theming running throughout the album. This idea of being sort of like trapped in a cage, being unable to be your true self, being scared of what other people might think from the outside. It's like undeniably gay. And so here is my long awaited queer analysis of Midnight's. I've actually already tried to film this video a couple of times and I've tried to squeeze the entire album into one video. That ain't gonna work, my camera battery keeps running out, there's just too much to say. So I'm gonna maybe talk about like six, seven, maybe eight songs in this video, and then if you guys like it, I'll do the other half of the album in another video, because we've gotta have the time. But I do feel like I need to go into this video with a disclaimer. By making this video, I am not saying that Taylor Swift herself is queer. She might be, we don't know what Taylor is. Sadly, none of us are Taylor's best friends, which breaks my heart every day. But we don't know what Taylor's sexuality is. There is speculation on the internet that she might not be straight. I know Taylor Swift has got this like stereotype of being this like straight girl who dates all these boys and dumps them and writes songs about them. That's a whole other misogynistic video, I'm sure. But there's a lot of rumours as well that Taylor Swift might not be straight. We don't know. We don't know, Taylor Swift. We don't. Sadly. By making this video, I am not saying that Taylor Swift is a queer woman. I am saying that I am a queer woman, and here is what I see in Taylor's music. Here is how I interpret her music. I am massive on queer history. I spend a lot of my time researching queer history, and through that, I have this big fascination with like queer coding, queer flagging, and sort of all the different ways that people throughout history have had to sort of hide their sexuality in their art. And I just see it everywhere. I see queer coding and queer flagging in every single bit of media that I consume because I'm a queer woman and I see the world through that queer lens. So some quick definitions. Queer coding is basically the sort of subtextual coding of a character in the media as queer. So it's never explicitly said that a character is queer, it's just sort of like hinted at through like little stereotypes and things like that. Whereas queer flagging is something that people in real life do, something that queer people do to sort of maybe subtly hint to other queer people that they might be gay. And through this video we're going to go into loads of queer history and lots of examples of potential queer flagging, so I'm not going to go any deeper into that. But that's the kind of stuff that I see everywhere I look. So again, I am not saying that Taylor Swift is gay, I'm saying that I am gay and this is how I read Taylor's music. There's this really wonderful saying that I read somewhere one time and I, I tried to google it and I don't actually know if this saying even exists, but in my head it does. And it's something about how art stops belonging to just the artist the moment they put it out into the world. So as an artist, sorry, you can probably hear my cat going absolutely mental downstairs. She's playing with a toy. Very stereotypical of me. If you just hear like running and scampering, that's it. Do you hear that? And that's, that's a cat. <laughs> So as an artist, when you put your music out in the world, your writing, your music, your paintings, your photography, whatever it is, it stops belonging to just you. It belongs to anybody who consumes that art. And I think particularly in music, people can sort of 
take the words that you have written, especially Taylor Swift. She is such a wonderful, wonderful songwriter. And this is one of the reasons why she is such a superstar because her songwriting is so personal, but yet it's so universal. Like everyone in the world feels like they can relate to at least one Taylor song. So whilst her songs are very personal, people feel like it's written about them and that's why it's so successful. So when you do put that kind of songwriting out in the world, it belongs to whoever consumes it and whoever puts their own meanings on it. And I just think that's really beautiful. I think that's one of the most wonderful things about art. So the way we're gonna do this is I've got all the song lyrics on my phone. I'm gonna sort of underline and annotate on my phone and screen record. I'm gonna try and get it up on the screen here. We're gonna figure this out in edit. I, I'm just going into this blindly. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna talk you through what I as a queer woman see when I see Taylor's music. See Taylor's music, hear Taylor's music, see her lyrics. I really wanted to wear my Cornelia Street jumper, but it's just like, I feel like it's not the best for on camera because it's quite like bulky, but whatever. It doesn't really matter. Okay, where do we start? Let's just, let's dive straight in with what I think might be Taylor's gayest song of all time. Definitely the gayest song on the album. I see it as the sort of older sister, the continuation of Cornelia Street as we're talking about that. Um, and that is, of course, Maroon. This video is so different from anything I've ever filmed before. I have no idea how to like do this, but we're gonna give it a go. Okay, so the first verse. When the morning came, we were cleaning incense off your vinyl shelf because we lost track of time again. Straight in there. Incense and vinyl shelf. That's just so gay. Like I know that's a stereotype, but like what straight man is burning incense? I'm, I'm just saying incense immediately gay vinyl shelves probably less gay like i definitely know more men have vinyl shelves but like that's strikes me as a very lesbian thing to do um laughing with my feet in your, in your lap like you were my closest friend like you were my closest friend so this song is about somebody that taylor has fallen into a relationship with or like fallen in love with and at one point they were her closest friend or Maybe she is like laughing because everyone sees them as like really close friends, but they're actually not. This is something that you see with like gay relationships all the time. People refuse to see your partner as your partner. Everyone assumes you're like best friends. Everyone on the outside, like me and my girlfriend can walk down the street holding hands and people would, will still assume that we're just really close friends. Um, that's just like, I think that's something that every queer woman has to deal with. Like just assumptions that, just friends, that's it. How do we end up on the floor anyway? You say your roommate's cheap ass screw top rosé, that's how I see you every day now. That is like very, a very fast moving relationship. So you've gone from like not really seeing each other to now you see each other every single day. That is again, we're gonna be talking about a lot of like queer stereotypes in this video. So if you're offended by stereotypes, this isn't the one for you, but like that's kind of the only way to do this. So it's very much a queer stereotype that lesbians are like all or nothing. Like you meet somebody and you're in love and you've moved in within two weeks and you see them every day. And I must admit when me and my girlfriend got together, we saw each other every single day. And I chose you, the one I was dancing with in New York, no shoes. That is such an undeniable callback to Cornelia Street. Let me get up the lyrics to Cornelia Street because I'll try and remember them, but I'll get them wrong and then people will be mad at me. Wait a sec. So the song Cornelia Street on the Love album is about Taylor's old apartment that she had on Cornelia Street in New York. So the whole song is about New York and about this great love that she had in New York City. Um, so the lyrics were... I literally just saw them, where have they gone? You hold my hand on the street, walking back to that apartment. Years ago, we were just inside, barefoot in the kitchen, sacred new beginnings, that became my religion. So barefoot in the kitchen, sort of no shoes. I'm sure there's another lyric in here somewhere about like dancing, maybe not. I don't know, that whole thing really calls back to Cornelia Street for me. I just, uh, Cornelia Street is actually my one of my favorite Taylor songs ever. I love that song so much. Um, the burgundy on my t-shirt when you splashed your wine into me and how the blood rushed into my cheeks so scarlet it was the mark they saw on my collarbone that obviously calls back to some sort of like hickey or maybe a lipstick mark on the collarbone so like the mark they saw on the collarbone I'm really struggling to annotate this because I'm just doing it on my phone and my finger's too big um <laughs> 
the mark they saw on my collarbone. So they, who was they? Somebody on the outside saw a mark on a collarbone. I'm really gonna try and do this video without talking about actual like gala theory because this is my analysis as a queer person, not a gala analysis. So galas don't get mad at me. I know to which people think this is referring, but I'm, I'm not gonna go there because I'll just get shouted at. The rust that grew between telephones, the lips I used to call home, so scarlet, it was maroon. The rust that grew between telephones, I think of like long distance relationships, so you've got to like keep that relationship alive by like calling a lot. A lot of lesbian relationships are long distance. When you are queer, especially lesbian, it's really hard to meet people locally that you click with and it's again another stereotype. The lesbians do have long distance relationships, like it's really not that uncommon for people to literally travel between countries every weekend, every month. Really common, so this is a telephone relationship that sort of started to go a bit stale, rust is growing, they're not really talking that much. The lips I used to call home, so scarlet, it was maroon. Please tell me what man has scarlet lips, like scarlet, that is a bright red, nobody's lips are naturally that colour. This is lipstick. She's talking about some lips she used to call home that had lipstick on, so scarlet it was maroon. It's just so gay, Taylor, it's so gay. Uh, I also want to sort of mention here all the different references she's making to different sort of shades of red and pink. So you've got rosé, you've got burgundy, you've got wine, you've obviously got scarlet, maroon, is that all of them? You've got mention of rubies down here, again we'll talk about that again in a second. There's just so many mentions of different shades of pink and red, and if anybody's ever seen the lesbian pride flag, undeniably, there are lots of different shades of pink and red. I, I don't know why I'm Googling this now, because I know what it looks like and you can't see my computer screen, but I just, I just want to see. It's like pink and orange and red and white, and there's just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So obviously this first verse was about like the beginnings of relationship, that sort of like budding feeling for each other. And whereas the second verse here is about that relationship sort of going to shit a little bit. So when the silence came, we were shaking blind and hazy. How the hell did we lose sight of us again? Sobbing with your head in my hands. No, sobbing with your head in your hands. Ain't that the way shit always ends? You were standing hollow eyed in the hallway. Carnations you had thought were roses, that's us. Carnations. I have a lot to say about the use of carnations here. Um, in sort of like queer symbolism, you'll see mention of flowers coming up a lot, and throughout this video, you're gonna see a lot of mentions of flowers. So carnations, violets, lavender. They're all very sort of undeniably gay flowers. Um, and there's deep, deep history behind all these things. So carnations sort of goes back to Oscar Wilde. So Oscar Wilde was a poet who was gay, he actually got imprisoned at Reading Prison, which is where I'm from, for the crime of homosexuality. For his time, Oscar Wilde was pretty out and proud, I guess you could kind of say. Obviously there's a lot of history there, I'm not gonna go into all that. Um, but on the opening night of one of his plays, Oscar Wilde wore a green carnation in his buttonhole, and that sort of became a symbol within sort of his friendship group, within his sort of circles. If you wore a green carnation, you were symbolising that you were gay, you were open to exploring a homosexual relationship with another man. And so green carnations, carnations in general, very much became a queer flagging symbol. It was a way for gay men to sort of subtly signal to each other that they could be interested without letting the straight public know what was going on, because obviously as soon as a queer flagging symbol becomes known by the straight public, that's not a queer flagging thing anymore, that's just an outing. So here we've got carnations you had thought were roses, that's us. So carnations here, could that mean sort of homosexuality, gayness, you referring to the general public? So like to the public, it's hetero, but actually it's carnations, it's gay. It meant to be a friendship, maybe it's something more. And then moving on, we have I feel you no matter what, the rubies that I gave up. So for this sort of relationship, Taylor, and I'm gonna refer to like Taylor in this song as like, she's obviously the songwriter here. I'm gonna say like, Taylor might be talking about this. I'm not saying this is what Taylor 100% men I see from in my brain, this is what I'm seeing. I. I just don't want to get cancelled. <laughs> People get really angry at any reference to Taylor Swift being gay, which seems homophobic in itself. But just know when I'm saying Taylor, I'm not accusing her. 
I'm not accusing her of being gay, not that it's a bad thing anyway, but she's just a songwriter here, so I'm gonna be referring to her, obviously. Um, so what did Taylor have to potentially give up to be in this relationship? The rubies that I gave up. Rarely in straight relationships, or at least most straight relationships, do people have to give up things to be in that happy relationship. Whereas when you're queer, you've often got to give up a lot of stuff to be in that relationship. And then we go down to the bottom, so we've obviously got the chorus again, and then we got, I wait with your memory over me, that's a real fucking legacy, legacy, I mean, imagine the legacy, oh wait, got to draw on it, imagine the legacy if Taylor Swift came out, like, I'm not being funny, that would be huge for the queer community, that would be a real fucking legacy, um, and then down to the bottom, have I got anything else to say about this? Maybe actually, wine, I, in my head, there's a real thing connecting wine and queerness and I don't really know why that is because I gave it a google and there's not really much about it online I wonder if I make that connection in my head because of the sort of David Rose analogy in Schitt's Creek which Schitt's Creek is just one of my favorite tv shows of all time but David Rose is pansexual and he sort of describes sexuality by being like sometimes I like red wine sometimes I like white wine sometimes I'm partial to a bit of rosé like he's just not really fussy so I think in my head wine does equal gay but also Taylor uses wine a lot as sort of a symbol in her songs for like sexuality and she does it in such a clever way so I think whenever I see Taylor referring to wine it's sexy to me and I don't say sexuality in terms like queerness sexuality like being gay being lesbian just like general sexuality she always uses the image of like wine like spilling your wine or like sipping your wine things like that i'm really struggling with this screen recording already because every time i accidentally lock my phone it stops the screen recording and i've already missed out a whole thing in the middle that i'm gonna have to go and fix so <laughs> this is gonna be a mess but i'm gonna try my best okay let's move on to the next song Okay, next we're gonna do The Great War, and I've got a lot to say about this song. The first time I listened to this, and she actually used her pronouns, I just about died. Like, to me, it doesn't matter what the context of a song is, as soon as I hear, like, a female artist use the word her, it's just like, my heart, like, stops. I, I love it, I live for that kind of shit. The Great War is just, like, so symbolic this song so obviously the title the great war refers to world war one and she's kind of comparing her relationship this heartbreak she's going through to the great war like that is how how much this is kind of hurting her this is clearly a very rough breakup she's going through and i wouldn't even say breakup actually in regards to this song i say this is a very rough argument a rough patch in a relationship that her and her partner are trying to work their way through um is the the symbolism in this one is this is like i genuinely think some of taylor's best ever songwriting right here in this song and i feel like it's really really underrated but it's so beautiful so we have my knuckles were bruised like violets sucker punching walls cursed you as i sleep talked spineless in my tomb of silence tore your banners down took the battle underground and maybe it was ego swinging maybe it was her her flashes of the battle came back to me in a blur just again it doesn't matter of context she uses the word her <laughs> i love it um so i wonder here if it's like an argument and like an ex's name has come up potentially is kind of what i get there um so starting with this very first sentence my knuckles were bruised like violets if you're paying any attention for the last song i said violets massive in queer symbolism and that goes all the way back to sappho who was like an ancient greek poet i mean literally the reason why we use terms like sapphic and lesbian is because of sappho obviously sappho sapphic Sappho was from the island of Lesbos in Greece and therefore we have the term lesbian like it all goes back to her like she is the earliest account we really have of women loving women like it's incredible um so Sappho would write a lot about sort of like violets and the colour purple the colour purple has huge symbolism throughout queer history Oscar Wilde would write about spending purple nights with men 
You've got Renee Vivian, who was a sapphic poet. Sorry, I'm just reading directly from my notes here, so I don't miss anything out. Um, she wrote sapphic poems, and she and um, the title, The Muse of Violets. There was also a play called The Captive, which was about a sort of love relationship between two women. And the older woman was never present on stage. She was only ever represented by a bunch of violets on stage. So there's no denying that violets have a long and deeply entrenched history in queer history. So my knuckles are bruised like violets, obviously referring to the colour of bruises, purple, but also could it be referring to something more sapphic? Um, sucker punching walls, cursed you as a sleep talk, spineless in my tomb of silence. Spineless in my tomb of silence, she's very much saying that she's sort of isolated, she's being quiet about something, and maybe she feels like she's being spineless, being a coward for staying quiet about something, um, but she's kind of like stuck in this tomb, she can't escape it. Boya Banners Down took the battle underground. Maybe it was Ego Swinging, maybe it was her. Um, moving on to the sort of, is this the bridge? No, that's the chorus. Sorry, chorus. So the chorus starts with all that bloodshed, Crimson Clover. Crimson Clover is also fascinating here. This is kind of another reference to the colour sort of red as well. It's Crimson Red. I'm now doubting myself. Let me Google it. Yeah, so Crimson's like a dark red, which could be harking back to maroon and obviously all the sort of references to reds and pinks there. Um, but also, really, really interestingly, Crimson and Clover was a song by a band that I didn't write down here. Um, but also, Joan Jett covered the song Crimson Clover and it was really, really con controversial when she covered it because she did not change the pronouns. And for the time, that was like pretty scandalous. And Joan Jett never, I don't think she ever like explicitly said what her sexuality was, but it is kind of quite widely presumed that she was a gay woman. Um, so when she covered the song Crimson Clover, that was massive. Um, also, Crimson Clover is featured in an episode of The L Word, and I only know that because I went to listen to the song for this video and I could remember it being in The L Words, which... <laughs> that's just undeniably also gay. Sweet Dream was over, My Hand was the one you reached for all throughout the Great War. Not really too much, like, explicitly gay in this, but obviously this is just about the breakdown of this relationship or the argument, whatever. Um, you drew up some good faith treaties. I drew curtains closed. Again, that is sort of isolation. She's sort of like withdrawing into herself. Um, drank my poison all alone. You said I have to trust more freely, but Diesel is desire. You're playing with fire. So clearly she has some big problems with like trusting people. Could she have this big secret that simply can't get out? Uh, maybe it's the past that's talking. Screaming from the crypt. Again, crypt. She's stuck underground or she's stuck in this crypt. She can't escape it. Again, I've said at the beginning that there's just so much isolation running through this album. Um, telling me to punish you for things you never did, so I justified it. Again, and then we have the third verse, which, again, there's just so much in this. Um, it turned into something bigger, somewhere in the haze, we'll talk about Lavender Haze in a second, but that's quite an obvious, like, connection between those two songs. Got a sense I'd been betrayed, your finger on my hairpin triggers. Hairpin triggers is so telling to me. Um, so the use of the word hairpin throughout queer history is, is, like, undeniably, like, really rich. So this is kind of play on words here because guns have hair triggers, guns do not have hair pin triggers. She is specifically using the word hair pin here. Um, sort of dropping hair pins in the queer community is said to be sort of like dropping hints that you're gay. It's queer flagging. So it's, instead of saying the term queer flagging, you can say, oh, they're dropping hair pins. Like Stonewall, literally the birth of the gay rights movement was said to be the hair pin drop that was heard around the world. That was the headline. Taylor references hairpins quite a lot in her music, like a weird amount. Um, the one that sort of springs to mind is Right Where You Left Me from Evermore. She talks about hairpins there and there's a couple of other songs as well that I cannot remember off the top of my head. Um, so your finger on my hairpin triggers. Could this potentially be somebody threatening to out her? Somebody knows that this is a very sort of sensitive subject and your finger is sort of on that trigger. Somebody's about to pull that trigger and out her. And um, that's kind of what I get from that. Especially when it's sort of linked with the sort of idea of being betrayed in the previous line. 
Um, soldier down on the icy ground, looked up at me with honour and truth, broken and blue, so I called off the troops. That was the night I nearly lost you. I really thought I'd lost you. So again, not much gay in that last bit, but it's about relationships or breaking down or about to break down. And we can plant a memory garden, say a solemn prayer, place a poppy in my hair. Poppy isn't necessarily gay. Poppy, I think, refers to in the UK. I don't know if it's a thing in America, actually, but in the UK, the poppy represents the Great War and we wear it on mem Remembrance? Remembrance Day. Um, and then we end on that final verse again. So I promised we'd do Lavender Hayes next, so let's do that. Even the title of Lavender Hayes, this caused so much drama in the Swifty Gala community. It's like... This was like the great war of Taylor Swift fans. Lavender Hayes, when she announced that name, like the word lavender has undeniable connections to queer history, like undeniable. So Taylor sort of announced she was releasing a song called Lavender Hayes and all the gaylers were like, oh, just knocking my notebook. All the gaylers went mad because they were like, lavender, lavender Hayes, that's amazing. And then Taylor did, I think it was a TikTok or like an Instagram reel, I can't remember, a short about the sort of the reasoning behind the song or like what the song was about and I think that was actually the only time or one of the only times she did that for any song on the album which was very strange. But Taylor basically said in this video that Lavender Hayes was about all of the weird rumours about her relationship of the last six years and a lot of straight people took that to mean when she said weird rumours they were referring to the gala rumours and there was a lot of homophobia that came out about that that was genuinely a terrible time to be in sort of like the Taylor Swift fandom on any platform and people were being like really homophobic people took that as like a signal that they were allowed to be really homophobic it was it was awful it was really like it really was quite heartbreaking to see actually apparently the song was about all these weird rumours not actually saying what the weird rumours were and she also said that she heard the term lavender haze in a Mad Men episode um and it's like a historical phrase that people use and so obviously people were really upset about this whole thing and then the song came out and this is where <laughs> things got weird because the song is nothing to do with weird gay rumours the song's actually to do about how Taylor doesn't want to be a bride. She doesn't want to be sort of in a suburban white picket house kind of relationship. She doesn't want to be a bride. She doesn't want to be a one night stand. She just wants to be her and she wants to be in a relationship, whatever this relationship is. So in the end, the weird rumours she referred to were rumours about her being married, not about being gay. Um, and it was kind of like a sort of 180. It was, it was fantastic. Um, but it's about wanting to stay in the haze of sort of the early days of a relationship, kind of, I guess, without the expectations of having to get married and have to, like, do the societal thing, what society expects of you. Um, but let's, let's talk about lavender. Let's, like, actually share what the term lavender means in queer history, because I could literally do a whole video on this. I kind of have on my main channel. I'll link it down below but lavender. So lavender is kind of huge when it comes to queer history. I've already kind of spoken about sort of like purple. I don't know if the references to lavender came from like violets and sappho and it sort of turned into purple then lavender from that. Uh, like all the way back to Oscar Wilde and his like purple nights or purple hours spent with men. You have sappho and her violets. Then in 1926, Abraham Lincoln's biographer wrote that Abraham Lincoln had a streak of lavender running through him, which was kind of referencing he had a streak of gayness running through him. Um, then gay men were said to possess a dash of lavender, was a very common saying. Then there was the lavender scare, which happened in, I think, the 1950s. So the lavender, lavender scare came on the back of the red scare. So in America, people were terrified of communism. And the government became convinced that gay people were of weak morals and would quite quickly sell out the government if they got a chance to. So they used this as an excuse to push all gay people, gay men, out of the US government. And this was something called the Lavender Scare. People had to, like, report people they thought were gay. People would be outed to their entire communities. Like, people's lives would be looked into really, really deeply to assess whether or not they were gay. It became this huge like nationwide moral panic about gay people like gay people are gonna turn the whole country to communism it was this massive massive thing it was ridiculous 
And it became known as the Lavender Scare because lavender men were said to possess a dash of lavender. Like that was a very common saying. Gay men were called lavender lads. And not just gay men either, of course. Like lesbianism is referred to as the lavender menace, which I love, by the way. I might actually get that tattooed. <laughs> I love that. And then in 1969, with the birth of the gay rights movement at Stonewall, at the first ever Pride March held in New York City a week after Stonewall happened, Lavender sort of became a symbol of empowerment. Like there's this long standing sort of history throughout queerness of gay people taking words and symbols that have been used against them and reclaiming them. Like they can't be painful, they can't be harmful anymore if we're claiming them for our own. And that is very much what they did with Lavender in that very first Pride March. The gay men marched with lavender sashes across their bodies. So if you couldn't before, after hearing that, you can probably understand why gay people were so upset when Taylor released this song or announced this song called Lavender Haze and they said it was about straightness, which like people were really upset about it, me included. Like it just felt like a bit of like a, Taylor presents herself as very much a queer ally. It just seemed a bit thoughtless and a bit, tone deaf I think is probably the right word but I think that changed when the song was actually released and it wasn't really about that at all. In terms of sort of the song itself and the lyrics there's not loads I can really pick out here. Um, staring at the ceiling with you and you don't ever say too much and you don't really read into my me melancholia. This whereas Taylor's like said this song is about like being in like a very happy relationship like wanting to be in that lavender haze forever it immediately starts with like, this is unhappy. Like this person is laying next to her in bed and staring at the ceiling and not saying anything and Taylor's sad and this person's not asking her why she's sad, like not reading into her melancholia. Um, I've been under scrutiny, you handle it beautifully, all this shit is new to me. So then it like immediately switches and it's like, yeah, this is a great relationship. Like I've been under scrutiny, you've been handling it really well. Like, this is great. So it's very, like, juxtaposed immediately in that first verse. I feel the lavender haze creeping up on me. Creeping up on me? Is that, like, the gay creeping up? Just gayness slowly. It, like, slowly creeps up on some people, as it did me. Um, I'm damned if I do give a damn what people say. No deal. The 1950s shit they want from me. I just want to stay in that lavender haze. 1950s in reference to... The word lavender is really interesting because that's when the lavender scare happened. Um, all they keep asking me is if I'm going to be your bride. The only kind of girl they see is one knight or a wife. So immediately it's like subverting society's expectations of what a woman should be. Like I don't want to be a bride. I don't want to be one I stand. I just want to be me. Um, I find it dizzying. They're bringing up my history but you weren't even listening. So who is they? So somebody's bringing up Taylor's history and you weren't even listening. The way that I read this is people are bringing up Taylor's gayness. People are bringing up the fact that a lot of these songs are undeniably queer and you weren't even listening. But I don't think she's speaking here to her partner. I think she's speaking to her audience. I think they're bringing up my history. You're not listening. You're not paying attention. Like you're only seeing what you want to see. Um, and then again, we have the second chorus. Talk your talk and go viral. I just need this love spiral. Get it off your chest. A lot of people really like read into this, get it off your chest, get it off my desk thing. But I don't really think I can go into that without talking about like actual gala theory. And I don't, that's not what this video is. So I'm going to like pass, brush over that. Um, just in case I get comments being like, why did you miss that? Also, I guess the term like lavender haze, like haze is sort of like ambiguity. Like she wants to stay in this lavender haze. She wants to like be queer, but people not entirely be sure. Like it's kind of like a, I'm not gonna come out. I'm gonna live in this like weird sort of purgatory where nobody knows if I'm gay or straight. And that's kind of the way I want it to be. And which I just think is, if that is what it means, we don't know if that's what it means, but that's how I'm reading it. And if, it, if I'm reading it correctly, I just think she's a genius. Taylor Swift, like certified genius. Also, I do want to take a moment here to talk about the Lavender Haze music video as well. I could do a whole other video on music video, so I'm really not going to go that deep into it here, but I found it really, really interesting how the sort of colours of the music video, so sort of the purples, the pinks, the whites, like undeniably that's sort of the colour theme running through it. That's the bisexual flag, just saying. Um, also, the use of koi's in it, really randomly, there's just like koi fish. Could that be a play on words with the term koi? So K-O-I fish, 
C-O-Y, koi. Let me get up the definition for like koi. So koi has got kind of two definitions. So one is making a pretense of shyness or modesty that's intended to be alluring or being reluctant to give details about something regarded as sensitive. So Taylor's being coy here. She's like reluctant to give full details. And then I also just wanna point out that her love interest in this video is Laith Ashley, who is a trans man. And that is fascinating to me because I might be reading too much into it, but through Taylor being a woman and Ashley, Laith Ashley being a trans man, that is undeniably a straight relationship. That is a male female relationship, but it's also queer. Through Laith Ashley being a trans man, he is automatically queer and that makes the relationship a queer relationship, which I found really, really interesting. Like, could that be intended as a real life parallel? Like things appearing heterosexual on the outside, everyone looking in, but it's inherently queer in like the middle, in the middle, in like the heart of it. I'm not gonna lie to you, I've been talking already for so much longer than I intended to. I told you, there is so much to say about this album. Um, and I'm worried that my camera battery is gonna run out soon. So I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more song, but maybe I can do two, we'll see. Okay, next we're gonna do You're On Your Own Kid. Again, I bloody love this song. I really, really love this song. This was such a grower as well. Like I didn't really like this the first time I heard it. Now, one of my top six on the album. <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't sound that impressive, but I like all the songs on this album. So to me, You're On Your Own Kid feels very much like a coming out song. Like I relate to this as being a coming out song. Again, I'm not saying that's for sure what it is. I'm saying that's how I relate to the song. That's how I read into this. Um, but all in all, it's kind of about like growing up and coming to realize that the only person you can really rely on is yourself. It kind of follows Taylor through her whole life. Also to me, it's kind of about the sacrifices that you've got to make when you come out. Like for a lot of people coming out is gonna change their whole entire world. Like the lucky ones are the people who can still carry on as normal after they've come out. For so many people coming out is a massive sacrifice and for your own happiness, you've maybe got to sacrifice your family or their views of you or your friends or like the lifestyle that you're accustomed to. Summer went away, still the yearning stays. I play it cool with the best of them. I wait patiently, he's gonna notice me. It's okay, we're the best of friends. Anyway, I hear it in your voice. You're smoking with your boys. I touch my phone as if it's your face. I didn't choose this town. I dream of getting out. There's just one who could make me stay all my days. Honestly, in those first two, I don't really have too much to say about this. Um, it's about like wanting to get out of your town. It's about sort of waiting desperately for someone to notice me. It's okay, we're the best of friends. Again, the idea of like being best friends with somebody that you want to like really notice you. Very lesbian yearning. From sprinkler splashes to fireplace ashes, I waited ages to see you there. I searched the party of better bodies just to learn that you never cared. You're on your own kid, you always have been. To me, this just screams like yearning. Like lesbian yearning is such a thing. And like being best friends with somebody who you're like, you're, like hopelessly in love with is such a thing like it happens every lesbian every queer woman i've ever spoken to has a story of being in love with their best friend and just like that hopeless yearning and not being able to do anything about it and from sprinkler splashes to fireplace ashes i see that as like from childhood through to like old age being elderly so sprinkler splashes playing in the sort of sprinklers fireplace ashes sitting in front of the fire or maybe even ashes literally as in cremation or it could be from summer to winter so sprinklers to fireplaces um i waited ages to see you there i searched the party of better bodies just to learn that you never cared you're on your own kid and always have been this idea of like being on your own my annotations are so bad you can, you can kind of get what i'm doing um you're on your own kid like queer people it's very isolating and very lonely and a lot of the time you are on your own, you don't have any other choices. You've only got yourself to sort of rely on and trust in. I see the great escape, so wanting to escape. So long Daisy May, I picked the petals, he loved me not. Something different bloomed, writing in my room. This is like, maybe grow up, you grow up thinking you're straight, you grow up sort of really succumbing to that like heteronormativity that society expects from you. So you grow up thinking you're straight or maybe at least bisexual and then you slowly come to realise that 
mm, that's not quite right. That's just what society expected of me. So something different bloomed writing in my room. I see that as like, she's sitting in her room writing and she has a realization like something different is here, especially like with the, I picked the petals, he loved me not right in the previous sentence. Like you've come to realize this boy's not interested in you. You do some introspection, something different blooms. I don't know. I think the phrase I'm trying to reach for there is queer awakening, like something different bloomed could be a sort of queer awakening moment. Somebody much more like literate than me <laughs> would probably do a much better job of analyzing this. I'm no student, like I didn't do literature at uni or anything, I didn't even go to uni, so I don't really know how to analyze things like properly. This is just me talking shit in my office. Um, I play my songs in the parking lot, I run away, and then from sprinkler splashes to fireplace ashes, I call a taxi to take me there. I search the party of better bodies just to learn that my dreams aren't rare. You're on your own, kid, you always have been. Like this, like this song is about like your life changing, you like growing up or you like coming to realize that what you've got in your like hometown or wherever you're living isn't what you want. So you sort of move on, it's changing, moving on from relationship, whether that's with family or a lover or friends, you move out of town, you're sort of growing up and away and really like coming into your own as yourself. This or sort of last verse or last chorus, or is it the bridge? I don't know, this last bit really like is the most telling for me here. Um, so from sprinkler splashes to fireplace ashes, I gave my blood, sweat and tears for this. I hosted parties and starved my body like I'd be saved by a perfect kiss. Nothing to do with queerness, but that last couple of sentences like destroys me. I hosted parties and starved my body like. Um, the jokes weren't funny. Jokes about what weren't funny? Like is that maybe jokes about queerness? Not funny. Um, I took the money. My friends from home don't know what to say. So it's this feeling of like being isolated from your friends, you're like making life decisions that they don't really know what to do with you and you're like doing silly things and they're like, ah, we don't know how to help you. Or like, they're all straight and you're queer and you're like exploring the side of yourself and and they don't really know how to relate to that. That is something I relate to so much. I really, when I actually got in my relationship with my girlfriend, like my first proper queer relationship, after years of pining after any woman who showed me any attention, I found myself really struggling to relate to my sort of straight friends and I found them struggling to relate to me because our life experiences now were so different and it's really, really isolating. Again, that sort of calls back to the theme of isolation throughout this whole album. Um, I looked around in a blood-soaked gown and I saw something they can't take away. Blood-soaked gown is very carry, like public humiliation, being sort of outed, everyone can maybe see your pain. Taylor's like at a point where she's being publicly humiliated here. So she's looking around in this blood soaked gown and then she's seen something, maybe seen like a love or some part of her that they can't take away from her, like that's just hers. Um, Cause there were pages turned with the bridges burned. Everything you lose is a step you take. So make the friendship bracelets, take the moment and taste it. You've got no reason to be afraid. This song is just so beautiful, it's about like, grabbing your life and doing with your life what you want to do with it and don't listen to anyone else and just live your life and I love the ending of this song it's very like after a very heartbreaking song it's very uplifting like so make those friendship bracelets take the moment and taste it you've got no reason to be afraid like you're on your own kid you always have been it sort of flips the idea of like you're on your own as being like a negative thing to like a good thing. Like you're on your own kids, like go out and do what you want to do and can do with your life. Um, I do want to take a moment to talk about this friendship bracelet here. I know I said I wasn't gonna talk about anything like specifically gala, but I'm just gonna like say the friendship bracelet. If you know, you know, the gay pride, the bisexual pride <laughs> flag bracelet, just, we know. Okay, I think I've got enough battery life left to do one more song. So we're gonna do I really want to do a question, but I actually don't think I've got enough time left on this to be able to say everything I want to say about question. Maybe I should like save that for a second video. So let's do Dear Reader. Dear Reader is a really beautiful song that kind of seems to me, it's like Taylor saying, I've got all these secrets. I'm never gonna share them with you. Don't idolize me. I'm not an icon, I'm just me. I don't look up to me in any way. Like I've got all these flaws, I've got all these secrets. I never want to share, I never will share. It's about keeping your secrets close to your chest. It's about like, you don't have to share things publicly that you don't want to share. 
which I think as a sort of public figure here on the internet, I know I'm obviously nowhere near as big as Taylor Swift. Like I actually think I'd hate being as big as Taylor Swift, but it's like a nice message. It's something like good to remember. Like you don't have to share all your secrets. Like you really should keep some things to yourself. But also to me, this song kind of reads like an apology. She's making an apology to her audience as well, being like, I'm sorry, don't idolize me. Like, could this be an apology to her queer audience being like, I'm sorry, I'm not brave enough to come out. I'm sorry that I'm not able to come out, but this is what you're gonna get instead. Like, I think this is probably the closest we'll ever get to a coming out. Like this, I don't mean this song, maybe this song, but like this album is the closest we'll ever get to an actual coming out because I don't think there ever will be one if I'm, if Taylor is gay. So a lot of people say this kind of reads like an Agony Aunt column, but I actually don't think Taylor's making so much of a reference to Agony Aunt. Maybe she is, maybe it's like multi-faceted. Um, but I actually think this harks back to more Jane Austen. Jane Austen has this habit in her books of like referring to like, she talks directly to the reader. She starts a thing with like, dear reader and then talks directly to the reader and I feel like knowing Taylor Swift I don't know Taylor Swift I wish I knew Taylor Swift but knowing what we know about Taylor Swift the Jane Austen thing thing it's it seems right dear reader if it feels like a trap you're already in one dear reader get out your map pick somewhere and just run dear reader burn all the files desert all your past lives and if you don't recognize yourself that means you did it right that bit seems really really similar doesn't it to um Oh my god, what was the last song we talked about? Why does my brain suddenly not work? Oh, you're on your own, kid. So that's like a really similar theme to you're on your own, kid. Like, desert all your past lives. If you don't recognise yourself, it means you did it right. Like, pack up, move on. You're on your own, kid. Live your best life. Um, never take advice from somebody who's falling apart. So Taylor's saying, like, don't take advice from me. I'm not, I'm falling apart. Um, dear reader, bend when you can, snap when you have to. For me, that is very much about like fitting into a box, like bend when you can, snap when you have to, like fit into that box if you need to. Also, Legally Blonde, like, <laughs> I don't know if she means to reference Legally Blonde here, but she probably does. Um, dear reader, you don't have to answer just because they asked you. Dear reader, the greatest of luxuries is your secret. Dear reader, when you aim at the devil, make sure you don't miss. So again, we have the idea of keeping secrets. She's like, I've got my secrets. You don't have to tell them just because they asked. You've got to keep those secrets to yourself. Dear reader, when you aim at the devil, make sure you don't miss. Very interesting to me, this one. When you aim at the devil, make sure you don't miss. So it's like when you're sinning, you sin big. Don't sin a little bit, like sin big. And for a lot of Christians, homosexuality is one of the biggest sins you can commit. So, and obviously Taylor grew up in the South, she grew up in Nashville, I'm sure surrounded by a lot of Christianity, a lot of those views being like put upon her. So when you aim at the devil, make sure you don't miss. So I want to three these nights, I prefer hiding in plain sight. So this to me screams like glass closet, like she is hiding in plain sight, like all the information is out there if you want it, but here she is, she's hiding, nobody's really picking up on it. It's very much like a, a homophobic thing I suppose within the media a lot of the media really chooses to ignore gayness and queerness in any sort of aspect because they just find it awkward to talk about they don't want to draw attention to homosexuality and so they won't mention it even if it's right there I should clarify that I'm not saying the media should out people but I'm saying a lot of the time even when people are out the media will conveniently ignore that fact you'll find pictures of like queer couples on the red carpet like lesbians holding hands and it's like oh yeah look at these gal pals just being gal pals being best friends because that's all gals are and um, my fourth drink in my hand these desperate prayers of a cursed man taylor sings a lot of songs from the male perspective and i don't actually think taylor and please do correct me if i'm wrong here I haven't seen at least Taylor ever publicly say that these songs are from the perspective of a man. Like Betty, for example, people say that Betty from Folklore is from the perspective of a man. It's not gay, it's just from a man's perspective. But if you go into it, if you don't go into it with that sort of like mindset, it sounds gay. It sounds like undeniably sapphic. It is Taylor Swift singing about Betty, a woman. Um, so... Could that be a reference to how Taylor sings from the male perspective, like these desperate prayers of a cursed man? 
um, spilling out to you for free, but darling, darling, please, you wouldn't take my word for it if you knew who was talking, if you knew where I was walking, like, where is she walking? Like, where's so bad that she's, like, walking in the wrong place for people to, like, take her advice? Um, to a house, not a home, all alone, because nobody's there. Again, this idea of isolation, where I pace in my pen. So she's, again, trapped. She's trapped in a pen. And my friends found friends who care. No one sees when you lose when you're playing Solitaire. So Solitaire is obviously a single person card game. So again, that's the idea of isolation. She's on her own, which is really, really interesting when Taylor is allegedly as far as everyone's aware, in a six year long relationship with this man. But this entire album is about isolation, about being alone. And don't get me wrong, I do understand that being such a massive celebrity must lead to a huge amount of isolation, feeling very alone, very trapped. But we're looking at it here from the queer, queer perspective. You should find another guiding light, Guiding Light by Shine So Bright here. I think she's referring to just her sardom. Um, you should find another, find another, find another find another. She's like, don't look up to me. Whatever you do, don't look up to me. I'm not great. Stop looking up to me. Um, this song is just about keeping your secrets close to your chest. You don't have to share things publicly if you don't want to share things publicly. Okay, I do think I'm going to end that there on kind of like a cliffhanger because I know I haven't spoken about Question and Question is undeniably also incredibly, incredibly sapphic. But I want to be able to really get into it and not worry about my camera running out. So I am going to sort of end that here. I will talk about Question and I'll also talk about Hits Different, which is the bonus track on the Lavender edition, Lavender edition only, of the album available at Target in America. It's still not on Spotify, but it's such a good song. So we have Question, we'll have Hits Different, we'll have Midnight Rain, and more. What else? The rest of the album, I guess. Bejeweled. Bejeweled has many queer themes running through it. Um... That will be in a part two. If you like this video, then please let me know if you do want a part two. Again, I just really want to stress, I'm not outing anyone for doing this video. I'm not 100% saying that Taylor Swift is a queer woman, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying I'm a queer woman. This is how I understand Taylor's music. This is what it means to me. This is how it references queer history, whether on purpose or not. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.